I know that this has been a long day if you've been here since this morning. And they say that you only absorb up to 20% of content um, in conferences like this. So I invite you guys to take a deep breath. <laughs> and appreciate that you've been here inside on a very hot day. Um, and I want to thank the organizers because I know it's a lot of work. Um, and let's get started. Um, so the slides, I'm going to talk through them and then hopefully at the end we'll have some time for some Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, please let me know. All right. So I wanted to start with this topic, the intersection of intuition and data being authentic in your marketing, because I've seen a lot of data and I've seen a lot of digital marketing um, talks and speakings and you know, they sort of dive deep into how to do each of them. Um, I'm going to talk through and give you guys a little bit of permission to do both and maybe not master either. Um, but we'll get into that. So, about me. My name is Rachel Avery Conley. Um, I found home at MIT CSAIL. I wasn't a student there, I actually worked there. Um, CSAIL is the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. And what I found there was actually WordPress when it first came out. Um, I spoke with one of the sysadmins and I said, you know, I really want to do this blogging thing. And they were like, so there's this new thing called WordPress. And I was like, awesome. <laughs> um, and then really got involved in the community here. And then when my husband and I and my son moved to Connecticut, um, maintained and, and um, stayed affiliated with the community. Um, so I think you guys are in the right place. I highly believe in WordPress. Um, I left MIT to create my own photography studio called RIC Portraits, and all of my photographer friends kept asking me, can you blog for me on WordPress? And I was like, no, guys, it has to be your voice, it has to be like marketing, it's you, it has to be authentic. And then I thought, hold up, they want to give me money, let me figure this out. <laughs> so, so I started a company called Photoscribe where I was blogging for photographers. Um, and I was doing it with a system of templates, so I was doing it in their voice. And um, most of my clients were on WordPress, and which I loved because I was really able to get in and see a lot of different themes. And this was um, 2013, 2014, so WordPress was evolving, photography was evolving. Um, it was a good time to be alive. <laughs> um, I sold it in 2017 to a company called Shoot.Edit. Um, they handle outsourced editing for photographers, and so they added blogging out to their service, it made sense. I exited the company, my husband and I moved to Connecticut and bought an apple orchard, not really sure what we were doing there either. <laughs> There's a lot of apples to be picked up, but we make it work. Um, and I joined a company called Zag Interactive, which doesn't work on WordPress, and their um, target audience is banks and credit unions. So moving from photographers and creative entrepreneurs to banks and credit unions was a huge shift for me. Um, but what I've learned is, is the topic of this talk. It's that it doesn't matter what your audience are, is, as long as you have the right data. Um, so again, you know, I was really understanding what photographers wanted. I had been one. I really knew the target audience. I had sort of preliminary data knowledge in terms of what Google Analytics was. Um, I had some plugins in WordPress that would tell me when good times, you know, when people visited the website. Um, Facebook ads weren't as nuanced as they are now, so I didn't. It was more organic. Um, but then, moving towards banks and credit unions, all of that thing, those things that I thought I intuitively knew, kind of went out the window, right? So if you're a wedding photographer and your target client is a bride, then most of your traffic is hitting on a Friday and a Saturday. And it's mostly coming from mobile. And I was like, well, everybody's on mobile now, right? Well, for banks and credit unions, their uh, target time is actually between 6 a.m. and 2 p.m. And 90% of their traffic is on desktop. And I was like, what? Right? Like, who's on a desktop, but again, if you're logging into your online banking and you're doing it from work and you're doing it from your desktop computer, that's, that's the difference. Um, so it really got me thinking about 
what does that mean for marketing? Um, and what does that mean for social media specifically? And we'll talk through more of um, all of digital marketing, but social media is in all of our lives. Whether it's through for your business, whether it's for your personal use. Um, so I kind of, I, I wanted to start with a slide because I was doing a social media audit for a company and they were killing it. They were really doing a great job, but they were posting on Twitter like six times a day. And so, you know, I said, you know, you're doing Facebook ads, you're doing Google PPC, you're, you know, you really know your target dem demographics, you've gone through the Google Analytics. You don't have to post on Twitter six times a day. Like, it's okay not to do that. And the relief on this person's face was like, but I thought I was supposed to. But here's the thing, there, there is no supposed to. There is no perfect equation. I don't know if I'm you know, hurting some of your dreams. <laughs> um, there is no perfect equation in terms of, I have to do this on this um, platform. But it, it really is about, I, I have to do this because I want to reach the right audience. And I want to do it so that social media is working for me, these ads are working for me, instead of me working for them. Right? I, I would see a lot of entrepreneurs who would really get stuck in that cycle and say like, you know, this is a Tuesday, I have to blog on a Tuesday. And yes, that holds you accountable and I, I think you should be on a schedule. But if you don't hit it, like, again, it's, it's all about testing and retesting. Um, so I wanted to start there. So part of this is I'm going to give you guys permission to not post on Twitter six times a day and have it be okay even for your businesses. <laughs> Or if that's an area you've identified where you have a lot of conversations or your business is one in which that Twitter would have those conversations, then it's okay to post six times a day, right? So how do you make that differentiation? How do you decide what platform to be on and how to you know, utilize it to the best of its ability? Right, so we all need social media. I just said we all need to be there at some time. You don't want to build a house on land you don't own. Um, someone said this to me and it really, really clicked to me in terms of, yes, you need to be on social media, but the way that you're on social media uh, should be driving back to the, the land you own. The, uh, the land you own. And I'm assuming because you guys are here that you're on WordPress, which has so many outlets to be able to build quality landing pages, to be able to build quality content, to be able to build blog, which has recurring, content. Um, so when you do post on social media, when you do get that plan worked out, whatever it may be for you or your business, have it come back. Have it come back to uh, your website. Have it come back to a place where you own it. Um, and I, I really, like, this is something I really believe in because I've seen a lot of money spent in Facebook ads. I've seen a lot of money spent on things like LinkedIn and not get the return on investment because it's not coming back to their website. So that's, that's my first caveat. Um, so again, digital marketing should lead back to your website. Exceptions when using social media ads to build audiences. Um, this is also something I say with a grain of salt because there are a lot of um, fake profiles out there on all platforms. Um, obviously Facebook's in a lot of litigation even as early as this week. Um, so you just don't know. If you're paying, if you're pay to play, and in today's economy, I, I do recommend that it is something that you do, if you're doing it smartly, um, get it back to your website. Um, so be, but be wary of money spent there. So we know that we're working on a plan for our social media. We know that we're bringing them back to our website. Here's where more of the intuitive things come in. Know your target demographic. Build personas. Um, this was something that I felt was very like MBA. Um, and I was too, you know, designer, photographer for it. No, do it. <laughs> it you know, and it doesn't even have to be, it can really just be a pen and a paper of this is the person that I want to attract to my website. This is the person that I want to interact with in my business. Um, there are marketing personas that go into depth in terms of demographics and ages and you know for me it, it really is just I want to know who they are and here's my gut feelings and then 
I want to put myself in their shoes and see what they want. And then I want to ask for opinions other than my own. Um, this is always interesting in terms of, you know, you may think that you have a very diverse view of your business, but then you reach out to people in your community or ideally customers or ideally people reading your content and you say like, I think this is my target demographic. And then that person might come back and be like, yeah, dude, but I'm reading it and I'm not that person, but I like it. And so there's always that feedback of like, huh, all right. And then is that person, even that person who might be reading it, is that the person you want to read it, right? And yet, yes, we all want everybody to read it. But uh, it was interesting, I had a conversation about viral marketing. Would you rather have uh, like 10,000, 1,000 people visiting your website and only one of them book? Or would you rather have 100 people visiting your website and have 10 of them book or buy or purchase or you know follow through with a call to action? Um, and really, this is what if digital marketing does well, it may not get those thousands of people to your website, but it may get the hundred targeted and then ten of the buy, and that's a better ratio at any time. Um, trust your gut. I, I, you know, this is where, myself included, I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of website builders, a lot of digital marketers say like, oh, I don't, I feel this way, but, um, you know, go with it. This really is the land that you own. This is your digital storefront, this is your digital home, um, building a brand. You know, I, I give you permission to trust your gut. <laughs> um, so again, talking about tar target demographics, who are you building your website for? Going through those exercising, exercising, oh my goodness, it's late for me too. <laughs> when you work from home, this is about the nap time. No? <laughs> um, so who are you building your website for? And who do you want to attract on social media? Ideally, those really should be the same people, but sometimes it, it isn't. Um, and now I'm saying sometimes it isn't in reality when it should be, and sometimes it isn't just because your website may be attracting different people than social media. And if that's the case, I would ask you why. Why do you want to attract different people on your website than social media? What's the call to action? Are you building community on social media that you're not building on your website? Again, this is where I think brand continuity and bringing it all back together can only help you. It can only help you be authentic and it can only help your business or whatever you're promoting or whatever you're building be more who you are, you know? Um, so this is where we get into, okay, we've talked through intuitive marketing, marketing, we've talked through what you want, who you think should be there, maybe some surprises as to actually is there, but how do you know who actually is there besides talking to or your mom, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> um, so you want to back up your targets with data. Um, and it's okay not to be a data person. I feel like someone needs to hear that because I am not a data person. And this is where after selling Photoscribe, I recognized that I needed help. Um, and when I joined Zag Interactive, I was really fortunate we have a data analysis team and they do some really deep dives into things like Google Analytics and Heat Maps and Hotjar, and we'll, we'll talk through that. Um, and I didn't need to know how to do it, but when I got the answers that these reports were pulling back, all of a sudden a new world opened up in terms of, all right, my, my gut was correct. Maybe 70% correct, maybe not 100%, maybe not even 99%, but that was correct, and here is another 30% of things we can tweak. Here is another 30% of things that either the website can do better, social media can do better, or maybe simply letting go of the idea that that person is someone that I even want on my website. So again, it kind of goes both ways. Um, so find a way to get the data you need. Um, partner with a freelancer, Upwork.com, which I think was Odesk, Fiverr.com, and um, trade with fellow entrepreneurs. Um, I now have a network of data people, so I do the social media marketing and they do the data and we sort of switch things. Um, and, and it works really cohesively. Um, there are some great plugins in WordPress, specifically, so Google Tag Manager has a Google Tag Manager plugin. Google Tag Manager is, the, is, a, is a container that Google Analytics loads into, and again, I'm not gonna get deeper into it because I don't necessarily understand it, but if, if you are a data person, um, it's a great plugin. Um, there's also Monster Insights, which is a paid, a paid plugin. 
Um, you know, lots of options out there. Truly the best way that I've found to work with Google Analytics really dive deep is to find a friend. And, you know, to just be like, help, I'll pay you, please help. <laughs> um, because I think we all have our strengths and especially as an entrepreneur, I, I, I get it, like trying to do everything is really hard. Um, when you're bringing in clients, when you are trying to get new things, this is an area in which if it is not your forte, it's okay, find someone who is and, and you know, try and work with them and get that information. Um, here's the other thing. So, you find someone, you get these reports, everything's awesome, your intuition's working, right? There's this intersection of data and marketing. Data itself isn't 100%. Um, so, there's this case study of a friend of mine who he and I worked really closely we actually had a podcast, the WordPress Photography Podcast, if you're ever into listening about WordPress and photography. Um, what he was noticing is the GA reports were 40% less than actual sales numbers. Now again, these are some deep analytics. Like these are analytics going to e-commerce. And the fact that he could pull this blows my mind. But what I thought was really interesting is the findings that they found out. Firefox and Opera are blocking analytics and ad tracking by default. Safari is following suit for the next iOS and Mac OS. And Chrome, obviously, will probably never block Google ads. However, there are hundreds of tracking, blocking installations. So I heard this and I was like, you guys, I just got on the data bandwagon. What's up? Um, so I kind of, I wanted to include it here because what I took from it is, again, it can't be all data and it can't be all intuition, right? It really is this, spot of everyone's going to talk about Google Analytics and again there are some amazing people who can do some amazing things and then there's going to be people who talk about digital marketing, they're going to talk about social media, they're going to talk about Facebook but without the data and the data without the social media like none of them really get, give you that full picture um, so this is again my, my permission to you for someone who tells you well the data set and I've had clients say that to me too well, the data says, and you know, it's really a conversation of absolutely. If you want to go solely by that, but then again, we've done an ad at a time where the data said it potentially wouldn't be the best, and that's where you've gotten the most, you know, clicks for this week. So where does that look, right? Um, so it's it's conversation. It's building where you want your website to be, where you want your social media. Um, so, moving into Google Analytics and how difficult it can be in terms of, for people like me, um, things you can pull from Google Analytics, demographics and interest, this is key. Um, I really think it's important if you can pull, well, it's key in terms of with the geolocations. If your local is the new, cool, like, local is the new global in a lot of ways, right? So again, for the clients that I have been working with, mostly uh, photographers and then again banks and credit unions, they are specific to local locations. So it doesn't matter if we are getting traffic from outside of their geolocations in all of those areas. What matters is who's coming in in those geolocations and is it the people that they want to attract. Um, Google Analytics can tell you things like new and returning visitors, frequencies, and recency is sort of beyond mine, but if this is something that you want to know and you're partnering with someone, it's good to know that they can pull it and you can ask for it. Um, you can always tell device and browser, popular times of day, um, and then bounce rate, page views, and goal completions. Goal completions happen if they set up the goals or if goals have been set up in Google Analytics. So again, this is more advanced Google Analytics. But once it's set up and you understand what the goals are and you can request these reports, these are answers that really give you a lot of insight as to what's going on on the website and whether it's really going in the right direction. Um, so we've talked about the intuition. We've talked about the data. And again, bringing it all back together, 
the number one question that I always ask when I see Google Analytics results of any kind, really, I mean, even if you're just logging into Google Analytics and you're looking at their main dashboard, is it, is it, is it saying what you think it's going to say? Um, and I've had some surprises. Again, the banks and credit unions, that them mostly being on desktop to me, I was like, who's on desktop, really, right? But again, I mean, it makes sense for people who are traveling, who are doing those websites during work hours. Um, so it's a, qu a question that you can always ask yourself. If you log into Google Analytics, if you log into some of these data feeds, is it saying what you think it says? And then if it's not, what can you do to change it? Or what can you do to be more in line and target the people that it is bringing in, right? So there's not one right answer. There's not like, oh, it's not doing what I want it to do, so here's how to do it, what I want it to do. There's also the possibility of like, well, maybe I should be adjusting a little bit to what it is saying. Um, so once you have gone into Google Analytics, you've done your intuition, you've done your data, what, what I found in terms of narrowing your audience, the question I, you know, we just talked about, Google Analytics is indeed verifying what I was saying or it's totally off. One of the ways that you can do to narrow that audience down more, this is where the pay for play comes in. Um, Facebook ads, they're changing daily again, lots of litigation, but scary accurate. Uh, we did a store visit where I was working with a local uh, gym and they have locations in the three New England Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. And we had set up an ad so that if they viewed the ad and then walked into the location, which we didn't set up, the locations were on the page, on the Facebook location pages, then Facebook would tell us that that was called a store visit. And I was like, hold up. Like, you know, we all talk about tracking, we all talk about is your phone listening? I'm not confirming or denying that, but what? Like, it was telling us as the marketers that this ad had worked because it got someone literally in the door without us telling it where the door is, right? <laughs> so, there's a lot of information there. Um, Facebook ads are good. You can schedule Facebook and Instagram now in one place. Again, pay for play. I really, you can put not a lot of money and get a lot of results. Um, so this is just another way to pull data. You know, Google Analytics is always going to be the end all, be all. I say that, oh my goodness. Never say in technology that it's always going to be, right? Because things are always changing. So as of right now, Google Analytics is trying to stay on top of that. Um, but if your Google Analytics and your intuition are sort of somewhere apart, or even if they're not, Facebook ads, Google pay-per-click, and LinkedIn ads, um, especially really great for ads targeting job titles, are another way to get, to get some really great data. In a more community-based way too, again, these are your ads, these are what uh, digital marketing is in, in more than one sense. Um, and then it's just a question of testing and revising. Um, you know, we hear a lot about A-B testing. Google, I think Google Ads, if not Google Analytics itself, will let you do pretty robust A-B testing. Um, I think this is in this next slide. So go beyond Google Analytics, but heat maps, um, hot jar is a really great one if you hadn't seen. So it'll actually tell you where people's eyes are going, which I always think is a little bizarre. Um, I can tell you for banks and credit unions, Nobody scrolls down, they all go to the login. <laughs> it's interesting. For photographers, it's a little bit more diverse because, again, there's a lot more visual. Um, and then all of the other sort of non niche clients I've worked with are in the middle. Um, what I love is there's these places, userbob.com, real people testing your website videos. Um, so they'll actually go on and be like, Oh, so the, having had no knowledge of your website, and they'll, they'll record themselves and be like, oh, well, this website is selling X, Y, Z, and I can click here to buy it, or I can click here, to, you know, and, and I remember watching one, and it was so off, and I was like, how is this? Okay, I have a lot of work to do here, but it, again, in a way where when you're building something and you're so close to it, right, you don't necessarily have that blind spot until you, you 
really are exposed to it. Um, and again, it's not your mom, which I've had her look at my website and that wasn't productive. <laughs> but uh, A-B testing, it, this is sort of what I was talking about before. Google Optimize is the new service they're doing. And I think if they don't have a WordPress plugin, it's because it's part of Tag Manager and Tag Manager has the WordPress plugin. Um, Simple Page Tester is a WordPress plugin where you can test out different pages, uh, and I've used that, and I really like that. Um, and there is some pretty robust testing in Facebook ads um, in terms of you can try different captions, you can try different images, and you don't have to take away the main ad content that might have taken you a lot of time to create. Um, so this is where I think testing and retesting is always helpful. But again, A-B testing for me has always been one area in which, right, you really need to have all of the bigger stuff figured out, all of the data, all of the intuition, all of the big picture. And then when you're really creating that content, you know, you're able to get down and say, like, specifically, does this headline work versus that headline? So don't discount it, but it's not, you know, it's not a clear jump from the big picture to, like, does this caption work? But that's not to say that you can't always go up and down. There can all you know, you can have a macro view and a micro view. Um, these tools exist. Again, if A/B testing isn't your thing, there are, there are people that will do this service for you too. It's like find a data partner, find an A/B testing partner. They might be the same person, which would be awesome. <laughs> um, and then this is what I find really interesting. The more chances you give them to find you, the more likely they will. So. This is a, a screenshot pulled from Google Analytics. And again, I didn't even know this existed before I was partnering with a data person. But this is a way, this uh, website has goal conversion set up, there's Google PPC running, they have social media running. This is the path as to how these people got to their website. So organic search, 32 people out of 149. Direct search, they were typing it in, unavailable. Right, like you see that. I don't even know what that means. All right, that's cool. Paid search. But then I think it's really interesting where it gets into like organic search and direct after that. Direct times two to get to that conversion. Um, so this isn't actually the screenshot I wanted, but you didn't give me the one. But there was one path, one person got there by it was something like organic search times 17, direct search times 32, paid ads times three. So this person had this giant path to make that one conversion. But again, if you don't even know that this exists, if this kind of data you know, is out there in the world and, and you don't know it, how can you access it? Um, so I wanted to let you know, I wouldn't know how to set that up. But when I get that data, I can think like, wow, all right, I'm glad that I have the direct paid search, or uh, I'm glad that I have the paid search running. And in this case, where there's no social media, maybe social media would be a really good thing to add and, and talk through the platforms. Maybe a paid Facebook ad would be a really good thing to add. Um, so again, it's really getting what you can, not being a data person, it's okay, I'm giving you permission, or being a data person, and if you are, make friends. <laughs> Call me, no, just kidding. Um, so that's all that I had in terms of the presentation. Um, I wanted to give opportunity to talk through if you guys had any really sort of technical questions, and I see one in the back, but I'm gonna have you come to the mic and then I'll repeat what you say. Um, is that how we're doing this? Yes, sure. Hi. Hello. My question is for a uh, person about to launch a new blog. Yep. What would be a recommendation in terms of social media, uh, what to do right before launching or during launching, in terms of if it makes sense to run a campaign or wait until you develop some audience. Right, is it a, a totally new launch or are you like, is it a redesign? Totally new. Totally new, okay. Um, so the question is, and I'm gonna paraphrase it a little, um, new launch, what would you recommend to campaigns and I, I think it's a really good question. Um, so you'll hear conversations if it was a redesign, SEO would take a hit. So you would want to do some things, some boosting. Um, 
And I, I believe those same principles apply when you're thinking of a new launch. Um, I've seen some really well done launch campaigns done through social media um, for banks and credit union websites. What we do is a specific launch campaign like, hey, this is a new website. But again, in that case, they have an existing audience. So we're just telling them, come back to your website. Um, so what I would start with is if you don't have a social media audience, there may be some opportunity for you to put some money towards building it. In that case, that would be an opportunity to build the audience. And then once you're in the process of building the audience, you can also run some um, ads that would bring you back to a landing page, that would bring you back to what is your main call to action. It also would matter if your website was a one page, which is very popular right now, in terms of it, you know, you scroll down and you have the, the bars where this is the information, this is the call to action. Or if your website is a little bit deeper um, and has specific product pages or, again, information about what your service is. Um, and in your case, because if you don't necessarily have that data, you don't necessarily have that intuition other than what you truly believe, you know, there are, that would be a case to try all of the social medias, to try Facebook, to try Instagram, to try LinkedIn, to try, you know, and, and not put a lot of money. You can put $100 on an ad in each place, and you can see what works, and you can really see you know, but then be quick to cut, right? So if, again, if Twitter isn't working for you at all, then focus on putting your content on Facebook in both an organic and a paid way, and then you can always repurpose that on Twitter, but really focus on what works, right? And so this is where the data, that when it starts coming in, it's a, it's, in that case, it can really be, I don't want to say daily, because Google Analytics always has a lag, as does Facebook ads, but it, it can really be like, okay, what worked today? What works tomorrow? Keeping in mind, right, that a Monday is going to be different than a Friday, no matter what business you are. Um, so it's just about really putting your foot out there, seeing what works, and then testing, and then being ready to reevaluate and try something new. I hope that helped. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. So I work for a nonprofit, educational nonprofit. Yeah. The biggest problem I have is articulating metrics to my managers and stakeholders. Do you have any recommendations or any key metrics that you are important to call out? Are you a data person? I am the only data person. Okay, so then I'm going to frame it this way. Okay. So the question was, <laughs> um, so I've worked in higher education too, and it, it is interesting. So the question was, in a nonprofit or even um, specific to a nonprofit, if you are um, a data person and you're reporting to maybe a non-data person, what what do you want the key metric, metrics for them to talk on? Um, again, as a non-data person, my world opened up when I was given access to things like demographics, time of day, um, and things like those paths. Like direct isn't working, but organic is, which really is very rare. But again, in a nonprofit world, right? Um, we've tried paid, and this this has worked, but this has not. So it's really the, there's so much information that if you were to just give a report like that, um, and I've done that too. I've had LinkedIn where I've given a screenshot to a client, and I've said, "This is how your thing is, you know, your ad is working," and they're like, "Yeah, I don't know what that means," and I'm like. Yeah, I don't really either. Hold on. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's about, you know, and, and it might be as simple as asking that question. What do you want to know? And they might be like, oh, well, I don't know. But, you know, having the conversation of, I can show you demographics, time of day, geolocations. What would be most relevant to the conversations that you're having, right? Um, and throw it back to them and see what they say. I always find that's very enlightening. I think we have time for one more question. We have five minutes. Go right ahead.
as much views. Um, I don't disagree. What I found Facebook ads to be really good for is not necessarily targeting the people that are in your community, but targeting audiences that are, are not likes or not fans of your pages. Um, again, what Facebook marketing, when you're paying for it, does really well, there are some amazing audience insights. Now, I say that with a caveat that it's shrinking with the litigation. They used to pull from third party to find out some really shady stuff. So in one hand, I'm glad that's gone. In the other hand, it does make things narrow down a bit. But it's really, I've always found a two-pronged approach. If you're doing the organic post and you're asking the kinds of ice cream, which I love, and you're getting those responses, I mean, that's good content, right? And then if the, and, and you might just put a link in there just to see what happens with your organic audience, but then in your paid, the, the audience that you're paying for, you could go in and you could really, um, again, speaking of brides, you can target people who've gotten engaged within the past 30 days within 10 miles of a wedding venue address. So those people are not going to be fans of your page at this point, right? But you're hoping that they will in the future. And then those are the links that you might get. Hey, did you just get engaged? Yeah, I know you did because you just told Facebook you did and Facebook <laughs> told me you did. <laughs> so, I mean, that's where I really think the pay for play is, is the best, is when you reach outside of that organic audience and you find that, you know, who are the people that you don't have on your site yet, don't have in your Facebook group yet, but want to be there. And that's, right, so every so those six clicks will hopefully get you more return on your investment than somebody who you've already converted liking.